All right, if you'll open your Bibles with me tonight, we continue in Acts chapter 8. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 25. Acts chapter 8, we'll be looking at verses 25 through 40 in a sermon entitled, Obeying the Call. Part of my success as a teacher is not only um, an understanding of the curriculum or even what I do with the children in the classroom. Uh, I think for most jobs, um, there's a primary task for mine. It's it's teaching children. Uh, but the secondary task and the tertiary task can sometimes be just as important because that's the one that the boss finds very important. And we Yes, work uh, with this primary task in mind, but oftentimes it's these secondary things that get us those brownie points, but also keeps us in their good graces. And for my principal, obeying her call no matter what um, can look a little weird. I remember my very first day at Stone Elementary School. Um, it was a pretty normal day, um, but I had worn my my better teacher outfit with my church shoes. My shirt was tucked in. I looked the best that I could on that first day of school with my coworkers there at my very first day in this, in this county, making sure that, you know, they, they recognize me as a professional. And the call came through over the intercom. And Ms. Danzy called my name among many other men. There weren't many of us, but there were as many as there were. She called them all. And the call that day was that, Stone waste was coming and they were going to empty the dumpsters. But there was furniture in the dumpsters and Stone would not pick it up if there was furniture in there. And we had to get the furniture out of the dumpster before the county came to pick it up. But matters got worse in that we had already eaten lunch that day. And these are the dumpsters right behind the cafeteria. And so here we get out there, I'm in my Sunday vest, and I am climbing into a dumpster, and I look down, and guess who's in there already? Miss Danzy, and she's throwing me stuff, and I leave, I'm covered in milk. Obeying the call was not teaching children that day. Obeying the call was being flexible to this situation uh, that she had, she had given me. Sometimes I get the call in a different way. It comes over my phone, and I see Sandy Danzy, I say, oh, Lord. And I open my phone and I step outside and I say, all right, you're on speakerphone, Miss Danzy. Uh, you know, just w warning, don't share any information that the children, you know, shouldn't hear if you're going to talk about their peers or anything like that. And she says, I need you to come to my office. I'm sending a new coverage right now for your class. Drop what you're doing. I want you to come scare somebody. And I go up there to the office and it's a little boy and he's done drawing devil symbols on his paper and he's done all this stuff. And she wants me to go in there and put the preacher mode on. And do you know that Mr. Lindemann's a preacher? Yeah, I am. Here I come in the office, you know, and I'm going to tell them what's up. Sometimes obeying the call isn't teaching children primarily. There's some side tasks that go along with it. Sometimes the call is when she sprints down and she says, I've been riding the bad bus every day after school, but today I've got a meeting. Can you get on for me? And I get up there. And I have the bad bus and I'm leaning to and fro as the bus is bumping the curbs and trying to get the kids off as fast as they can. And I'm making sure people are quiet and sat down and I'm a bus monitor. It's not always teaching kids the task, obeying the call might look a little different than I'm used to. And the task might also be, she's going to tell me last, just a few months ago in December, here's this Santa Claus outfit. We're going to the high school. High schoolers, y'all, don't know if you're aware, aren't interested in a five foot six fella who is not always so jolly coming and being Santa Claus. And here we go around waving at all the kids at the high school, and they were not having it. It was the craziness that was obeying the call in this situation. And likewise, our success as followers of God is sometimes obeying a call that we might not necessarily understand the purpose of. We might not necessarily expect that this would be the call that the Lord would put on us and our willingness to obey that call, no matter the cost and whatever it might be, will be our success as a follower of God. And we find ourselves in Acts chapter eight with a person named Philip. Philip, who has gone down to Samaria and he has preached a revival service there. Peter and John have come down and the Spirit has been imparted upon these people at Samaria. 
But just as that's happening, we follow Philip's story a little bit further, and we see something very different that the Lord calls him to do here in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and he went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Here we have a story that continues from our story of last week. Philip, the evangelist, as many theologians call him, found himself the deacon outside, scattered outside of Jerusalem, now in the village of villages of Samaria. And it is here that a revival service takes place. Many people believe and are baptized. Peter and John come down and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where we pick up now as we begin in verse 25. It follows right out of the revival services of the great Samaritan revival, verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, that is, they preached it. When they had preached good and preached it all, they started back to Jerusalem, but they didn't make a, 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 a just a straight beeline out of Samaria. Verse 25 tells us that after they'd preached real good in this one Samaritan village where they'd been, where all of the previous story with Simon Magus had unfolded, as they make their way back to Jerusalem, verse 25 says, and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the Philip Graham Crusades. I mean, he is going through all of Samaria and every place that he stops at, what's he doing? But he's starting another revival service and another revival service. He's going as if he's very much akin to his person who's preceded him as Jesus goes and preaches village after village after village after village. And Philip is doing this, obeying this call of the Lord. And this traveling revival is headed back to First Baptist Church, Jerusalem, the headquarters for the early church. But it is along this very comfortable time that God is going to do something that is going to shake Philip all up. I don't know about you, but when the church is growing and when the spirit is moving and when the songs are good and when the preacher can make me say amen, those are good days at church. Those are days where I don't want to be anywhere else, where it's easy to come, where it's easy to reflect back on all that the Lord's doing. It's a comfortable place to be. I think there's a reason why mega churches and churches larger than our own and churches much larger than our own flock even more people. Why? Because it's in the midst of the masses seeing all of this just fervor for the Lord 
Well, who doesn't want to be a part of that? It's comfortable to see all of this taking place before you. And I can sit back and I can watch it unfold. I really don't even have to do much. Those people, those professional Christians, that staff of 12 at that big church, who's got 12 pastors on the staff board, that's, they, they can handle that. And I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch it. That's exciting. But it's in the comfort that sometimes God gives us a different call. And here for Philip, the call is not stay right where you are, continue to let this revival unfold, continue to have the masses come to you and to be revitalized throughout Samaria. God has a different call. And it comes to him in verse 26. But an angel of the Lord. (laughs) Some buts in scripture are good and some are challenging. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, in the middle of a revival service, on the way back to Jerusalem, things are going just according to plan. Get up and go south. Now, Jerusalem from Samaria is north. He's saying, go and go in the complete opposite direction. And Philip might say, is there more Samaritan villages that you want me to preach to, Lord? Can we see a revival across all of Samaria? Continue with me. That descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a road that leads out towards Egypt, out towards um, the Gaza Strip as we would know it. But if we continue down this road in ancient days, this road was known as the road that takes you to Egypt. It's a remote road. In fact, verse 26, scripture has its own kind of footnote here outside of the text in parentheses. Just to give us some clarification, this is a desert road. This is a road that is not often traveled. And here, I wonder, have you ever heard the Spirit say something to you? Call and speak to you to to do something or to, to say something that you were not expecting. Here, Philip is not expecting the Spirit to say Don't continue doing the things that are getting a lot of people to come to church. Don't continue doing a lot of things that is resulting in magnificent worship, spirit-filled worship. The last thing he expected the Spirit to say was, go down the desert road. But this is the command. This is the calling of the Lord. While in the midst of this revival, God is going to call Philip out of a comfortable place, out of a spiritually robust place to a place where he was not expecting, but he's going to be used in a tremendous way. He calls him down a desert road. And I remember, and I've shared this story in parts and pieces before, when I was graduating from William Carey, I was putting in applications everywhere to do any type of job that the Lord would call on me to do. I put in applications in New York, I, the state. I put in applications in California. I put in applications in all the places and states in between. Literally, if I pulled up the church on the SBC website job board and it didn't have qualifications of experience because it didn't have that or extra degrees that I didn't have, I was ready to go. I was talking to a guy in Virginia. He could pay me $500 a month. Lord have mercy. I'd have been poorer than I've ever been before, poorer than I could ever imagine. But I was ready to go to Virginia because I understood that if the Lord wanted me to go there and I was in dialogue with this guy and it was was starting to go that way, I'll go. I was talking to somebody in Georgia and I, I was ready to go. And all the while I'm talking to all these people that are in remote places very far away, God found down some dirt road. Brooklyn, Mississippi. Amen. And who'd have thought in a million years? I know I didn't. 15 minutes down the road from where I was going to college, I would have never in a million years thought I'd end up here in a place I didn't know about, had never heard of. I'm from Meridian. I I didn't know Purvis, much less Brooklyn. But yet, that's where the Lord called me. In fact, let me me sweeten the deal for you and let, let you understand. It's not a pat on my back or anything like that. It's the call of the Lord. I want you to understand how real it is. I had the opportunity to go back to my hometown of Meridian. At the time, my grandmother was still living. You know what she means to me. At the time, my whole family still lived in Meridian. There's all signs, family ties wise, was to go to Meridian. And I was interviewing at a church for youth pastor where they had 50 youth every, every Wednesday evening. And the youth were not in a place 
where they did not know the Lord. In fact, they told me these youth are ready to obey the call to ministry themselves. Some of them have experienced a similar call and they're ready to be youth pastors. They're ready to be preachers. They're ready to go to William Carey and study the same things you studied. That would have been comfortable. That would have been fulfilling. That would have been revival in Samaria level because here's all these people who are ready to take the next steps of faith. And the Lord let me hear. And at the time, we had a handful of youth and a handful of children. And I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do here, but I felt the very earnest call to come here down a desert road to a place I wasn't expecting. The call of the Lord is sometimes uncomfortable and unsuspecting. But if we're listening and we're truly seeking, we're going to do whatever he tells us to do. No matter what it is that we have to say, no matter what it is that we got to do, no matter who it is, the call of the Lord is one that's so specific and so fulfilling and, 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 and so really pull it at your heartstrings that it can't get out of your head, that you can't do anything but it because he's going to let you remember. He's going to let you know. And that's the calling I experienced. It's the call Philip here experiences because verse 27, what does he do? So he got up and he went. <laughs> In stark contrast to Moses and Exodus, who has two whole chapters where he dialogues with God about why he can't do what God said. Not Philip. There's no conversation between him and God. He feels it, so he gets up and he goes. And then it introduces us to the reason why he was called down here. Maybe we could assume there's a city. Like Jonah, he had a whole city, Nineveh. Maybe there's a city like Jonah that you can go and that whole city will repent and believe. Maybe, maybe there's some big task. Maybe you get to be some big bishop or pastor in the early church, Philip, and you can go to some place and plant a church like Paul's going to go on to do. No. The reason God sends Philip down this desert road, calls him to do this extraordinary thing. So he gets up and he goes, verse 27 says, and who does he find? There was an Ethiopian eunuch. That term Ethiopia there is not the same as we would think of our con the country Ethiopia. Ethiopia in ancient texts refers to this, any place that is south of Egypt. So this guy could be literally from anywhere in, in Africa. He could have come from anywhere. All of that was kind of branded the kingdom of Ethiopia. It was this exotic and foreign place. And so here he runs into not a nation, not a city, one individual. And I have to stop there and marvel at the fact. Here was Philip preaching with Peter and John, the apostles. Every Samaritan village, he was getting all of Samaria. And God said, that's under control. All these masses, I got that, Philip. I'm going to send you to talk to one. And that's where I have to stop, guys, and I have to say, each and every one of us, we have a call on our life, if we're a Christian, to go and to tell. And the Lord might have one person that's your responsibility. In this season, in this, in this year, in this decade, he might have one person that he needs you to talk to. Oh, Lord, that I would be faithful with few and that you would give me many and I would, I, I, would, I would have charge and responsibility over legions. But Philip shows us that sometimes the masses, the preacher who can call and do an altar call and have an invitation where hundreds and tens and, and many come, and respond, that's not always as important as the one. Don't forget the charge that you have that God might have called you to one individual. Who is that person? And what are you going to do in order to obey that call? God's love for the individual is so important that he would send Philip down a desert road in order to talk to just one. But this one is very detailed here in verse 27. He's described not only by his place, Ethiopia, but as his status, really, his presentation as a eunuch. A eunuch is a man who has been castrated for a purpose. And this one we go on to read. 
He is a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Castration, making a man a eunuch in the ancient world, was something that was actually pretty common. It ensured that the man who was in charge of the kingdom uh, and had really high responsibilities would not be tempted by lust and the desire for the women, the harem oftentimes, of the kingdom. And so he has been castrated for this very specific purpose. But the reality of it all is that he is missing (laughs) something that qualifies him in most regards, uh, I would think, as a man. And eunuchs, while they've been employed throughout many civilizations, um, we see in Scripture that there's a a lot of things um, that, that come up as a result of being a Jew or being a believer and being a eunuch. And so this is going to be something that is kind of a barrier for him to the gospel. And so we'll look at that in just a bit. So he's an Ethiopian, but he's also a eunuch. And his specific title is he's a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, just like in Egypt, maybe you're studied in history, many of the Egyptian kings of this era were known as Ptolemy. P-T is how it's spelled, Ptolemy. Um, maybe, maybe you don't know that. Maybe um, you understand that there, if you look back at English history, there's a lot of Henrys and Phillips and, you know, those types of names. Candace is that way for the Ethiopians. And here Luke's kind of just put in a little bit of history that's right in the middle of the Acts. Just like we had a few um, chapters ago, Gamaliel, Paul's teacher, and we had some other little tidbits of history. This history is just stuck in there so that we can look back years and years later and say, we have no clue who Candace is, but Luke wrote it for a reason. Why? To prove to the people of his day and age the historicity of the thing he's writing. People 200 years after Luke, if Luke is an imposter and he's writing 200 years later, people 200 years later wouldn't have known who Candace was. They would have said, that's garbage. Why is that in there? That's trash. That's something that shows that this is a false writing. But because he puts it in there, in Jesus' day, the people who know this queen of the Egyptians, uh, the Ethiopians, this is something that triggers those people of his day and his history and says, Oh, he knows what he's talking about. I know exactly the queen he's talking about. I know exactly, back in chapter, what, five, I know exactly the rabbi he's talking about. I know exactly the event he's talking about. These things are put in there for the historicity of Acts that we might know that this is truly time-stamped with um, its contemporaries. But more than that, he's not just an Ethiopian. He's not just a eunuch. He's not just under this queen, it continues, who was in charge of all her treasure. So we can see the high-ranking official that he is. He is CFO. He is treasurer of Ethiopia. He is in charge of all the treasures. No wonder he's a eunuch. He has such an important job. Nothing is going to get in the way of these types of dealings. But the most interesting part of his description is not where he's from. It's not what he looks like. It's not who he's under, who his supervisor is, not what his job is. It's why he's on this desert road. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Note why the eunuch's here. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship. And I just want to flip real quick because I think now is is a better time here. Let's flip to Deuteronomy chapter 23. I hinted at it. I want, to, I want to be very clear, though, at his introduction. A eunuch is one who, under Old Testament law, is an outsider. Not just because he's not Jewish. He's Ethiopian. Not just because he's not Jewish, but because of his occupation in the court, because of the way he is because he's been castrated. There's an issue here. Deuteronomy chapter 23, and Moses is preaching on the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, it's the very first verse. And the title of Deuteronomy chapter 23 is Persons Excluded from the Assembly in my Bible. That is, people who can't come to church. Let's be, let's be frank. Now, in, now, let's understand Why is God saying stuff like this? Because the assembly here is not just, it's not a synagogue. 
It's not a church. It's the holy temple where the presence of God is. And God lists all these people who cannot come in his holy temple. A holy temple, mind you, that Jesus tore the veil when he was crucified on the cross and allowed all peoples to come in. Chapter 23 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Well, the eunuch's disqualified. He can't come to the temple. It's important because why is he on the desert road? Verse 26, or excuse me, 27 tells us he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, we don't know how that went for him, but I can make a guess. As he tries to enter the temple, he don't get in. This eunuch had come all the way from somewhere south of Egypt in order to worship for some reason. So we might understand that he's heard of God, that he wants to follow God. We're going to find out later that he has Isaiah. He's, he's reading his Bible. But he, when he comes to Jerusalem, he doesn't stay. He had come to worship, but he's found going the opposite direction. This is a person who because of the way he presented in Jewish understanding, he is not to come into the assembly. He's a foreigner. He's a Gentile because he's from Ethiopia. And he's a person because of the way that he presents, because of the way that his body is. Yes, it was done to him or done by him. But this thing disqualifies him from even darting the door. And this is where Philip finds him. And the gospel call here, he not only walks up to this Ethiopian unit who had come to worship, but look at verse 28. He was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, I have to ask, Philip, what is the likelihood of this this run-in. Have you ever met somebody, um, had a conversation, wound up in a situation, and you leave from there and you say, what in the world was the likelihood that we would run into each other? What's the likelihood that we would have had that conversation? What's the likelihood that the two of us came to do this exact thing on this exact day, and we have these things in common? What's the likelihood of this? What is the likelihood that an Ethiopian and Philip would be on a desert road at the same time that he would be pulled off sitting in his chariot and more than that, reading Isaiah, the prophet that speaks of the Messiah more than any other prophet. And then let me up it for you because historically, we are the most blessed generation ever in God's history because we have the language or the Bible in our own language. We have a Bible that is in this pew, right? We have more Bibles in this room than we have people. (laughs) <laughs> that has never been historically the case. The fact that this eunuch from Ethiopia has the prophet Isaiah in his hands, Philip might not even have the prophet Isaiah in a form where he can read it and just take it out of his pocket. It is manuscripts, paper, reading material was so important, so financially a burden in this time that if you had the prophet Isaiah where you could just whip it out and read it on your chariot, you're a rich man. You're, you're a privileged man. You're somebody who, who's got something. What's the likelihood of all of these things as they come on this road? And what a perfect storm that God would prepare for Philip. What can we say of the calling of Philip? Be faithful when God calls. And when we're faithful when he calls, look at how he's prepared Philip's way. Philip got up and he went faithfully, obediently obeying the call of the Lord. And when he arrives, God has set all these things in motion that Philip likely leaves in the same type of way that we have before saying, what are the odds? God, I know you ordained this meeting. God, we've heard this one before, you've brought me here for a purpose today. I know this is what God brought me here for today. He looks at the eunuch on the chariot and he knows this is why God brought me here. He's prepared my way in this way. And the gospel will take us to some crazy places.
I can attest that uh, me and Anthony actually went one time doing evangelism door to door out here. And we wound up in the trailer park just down the road. And it was a crazy place. And it was one of those, God, you brought me here today for this reason, because the person we walked up to, first of all, the situation unfolded and we began presenting the gospel. And somebody very irritated came out of the house and said, you better not be no Mormons because they'd never heard of a Baptist going door to door. They'd only heard of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door. And we explained what we believe and what church we're a part of. And he was okay after that. But the buddy who we were talking to, it came out later in the conversation. This person who happened to answer the door, happened to have the conversation with me, was happening to hear the gospel that day, was not from Brooklyn, Mississippi. In fact, he was from, I believe it was New York. If Maybe Anthony can correct it later if I'm wrong. Um, but he was couch surfing <laughs> through the United States and had landed on this guy's couch. I think it was like a cousin or something as he came through. And he was actually headed out the very next day. I said, look, I don't know what you believe. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but I want to share this good news with you. And I shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ, that no matter what he's done in his past and no matter where he is right now in his life, there's a God who loves him and cares for him. And if he would but give his life over to him and believe in Jesus and trust in him and confess him as his Lord and Savior, he would be saved. I don't know if that young man got saved. I don't know where he's at right now and what he's up to. But I know that God put me there that day in order that I might say that before he got out of Brooklyn and went somewhere where there wasn't a preacher who was going to come and knock on the door. God puts us in places for specific reasons. And sometimes we look back on it and we say, that was crazy. But at the end of the day, the Lord put us there for that reason. In verse 29, we see the craziness of the Spirit. When you see the chariot parked in the ditch on the side of the road and the super fancy financially secure eunuch is sitting from Ethiopia is sitting in the chariot. Most of us would say, well, I'm not going over there. I'm not have a conversation with him. What do you, that, that's out of my comfort zone. That doesn't sound right. You want me to walk up to that lady in the middle of Walmart and tap her on the shoulder and say, ma'am, and she's going to pepper spray me. I mean, what do you, what do you think I'm going to, no, God. The Spirit, verse 29, said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. Huh? Get into the car? He's on the side of the road. You just want to get in with him. Yes, Philip, that's what I want you to do. And look at what Philip does. Philip, don't ask no questions. Verse 30, Philip ran up. He, he did not walk up to the chariot. He, out of the bushes, ran across the road and jumped in with a buddy. I mean, I'm telling you, this is crazy the way the Lord ordains things and the crazy situations he's going to put you in. Would you run up to the chariot? This is the faithful obedience to the call of the Lord, to earnestly and desirously run after and do whatever it takes. Evangelism in the early church is boldness. It's marked by that, that we would be bold enough to do whatever it takes. And look in Verse 30, ran up and he heard him. He's reading out loud. Heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. Man, Philip must have said, what are the odds? What are the chances? Lord, you've prepared my way. He heard him reading. What's the likelihood again that it would be the prophet? And then he asked a question. Here's how evangelism begins. When you hear, when you get the opportunity to talk to a Muslim, Evangelism begins with a relationship, and it begins with questions. There was a Muslim who worked in a gas station in Meridian, and I asked him questions. I saw a sign on the door one time when I pulled up. It said, praying, be right back. I went in, and I recognized that he was from Jordan, and he was a Muslim, and I said, where do you pray? Well, at so many times a day, I turn and I face Mecca, and I pray in the bathroom in the back of the gas station. I said, oh, that's very interesting. You're a religious man. I'm, that's, that's very interesting. And we, and we talked about it. And I said, well, you know, I'm a student of Hebrew. How do you say hello in your language? And he said, well, it's kind of a, a, a complicated phrase. Maybe you've heard of it before. Assalamu alaikum. That's how you say it in Arabic. And then I said, and let me see if I can say it. Assalamu alaikum, Ravi. That's friend in Hebrew. Is that friend in Arabic? No, he said uh, Rafiki or something, something crazy like that. I don't know. I ain't spoke to him in a long time. He went back to Jordan, actually. And so I learned and I had a relationship with him. I, I wanted to know. I, I asked questions of him. Why do you pray? 
What does this mean? Asking those questions sets up the scene that you might have an open dialogue and you might have the genuinely get to ask the question and to turn the conversation into, that's what you believe. Let me show you my faith. You pray this many times a day and face this place. Let me tell you of the God whom I pray to and who intercedes on my behalf. His name is Jesus. We have that opportunity in that dialogue. And here's what Philip does. He hears him reading the prophet and he says, do you get it? Do you understand it? Do you understand what you're reading? This same tactic was used by one of the people at New Orleans Seminary when they came for the Defend Conference. He actually had a a Muslim friend that he made in Starbucks. And he whipped out the Quran. This is the Christian. Whipped out the Quran and was reading the Quran when he saw the Muslim. And the Muslim walked over and guess what he said? Do you understand what you're reading? And it started this conversation. He actually came to Christ. What an amazing testimony. This questioning type of evangelism. We might see somebody who has a a cross necklace. We might see someone who has a, a fish sticker on the back of their car. We might see somebody who is presenting things that are Christian iconography. And we say to them, do you know what that cross means? I, I, every time I look at that cross, let me tell you the feeling it makes me feel inside. These are the open doors that we ask the question and we get the opportunity to share our faith because of it. We get to ask and we get, as a result, the opportunity to share. And guess what the eunuch says when he asks, do you understand what you read? In verse 31, how could I unless someone guides me? It reminds me of the Apostle Paul in Romans 10. How beautiful are the feet that bear the good news. How will they hear if not for a preacher? How will a preacher go unless he is sent? How beautiful are the feet that bring the good news? He asks, do you understand? And he says, well, I couldn't unless somebody would guide me. He invites him to further that relationship. A relationship here is born. And I think an important part here is, well, what's Philip going to do next? He's now been invited to explain the scriptures. Philip can't do that unless he's in his Bible. Unless Philip knows the passage and can explain the scriptures to this man, he is going to be useless for the Lord in evangelism. Just because the Spirit's guiding us and just because we have the opportunity doesn't mean we get a get-out-of-study-free card. We have to study the Word in order that in the day when the Lord prepares the way, we're proven ready for the task at hand. And look at the verse, verses 32 and 33. It's a verse from Isaiah 53. And it's a verse I'm going to read on Good Friday when we gather at 6 p.m. And it sets the scene for the crucifixion all the way back in the Old Testament. It's a prophecy of Jesus' death. He was led as a sheep to slaughter. As a lamb before its shear is silent, so so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. What is the likelihood that of all the places in Isaiah, he would be reading about Jesus? God prepared the way specifically for him. But Philip does the rest. Verse 35, he opens his mouth, And starting right there, he begins to tell them about Jesus. We have to open our mouth as well. We have to be ready to share the gospel as well. And how often, when God prepares the way, do we utilize the opportunity that he's given us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Every day, you might not notice it, but every day, God is preparing for every relationship that you have and every person you meet. He's preparing an opportunity for the gospel. But many of us are not utilizing it. It requires faithful study, and it requires that we open our mouth in boldness, in loving others in relationship, and an understanding of that powerful gospel message that we might impart it. But the most beautiful part of the story with the few minutes we have left is in verses 36 through 40. As they went along the road, remember this eunuch was already going down the road. He was leaving Jerusalem because he likely was not allowed into the temple. As they were going down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, listen to his words, look at it, water. 
what prevents me from being baptized? It's the the part of this passage that's often lost. This is a beautiful passage for preachers to preach for an understanding of how we might share the gospel. But what's lost is the power of the gospel in what is happening here with the eunuch. The eunuch just went to Jerusalem. He likely heard a lot about God, but when he got to the point and said, I want to be a Jew, was not entered, was not allowed to enter into the temple. Under the old covenant, this man was an outsider. This man was a person who, because of the way, as a eunuch being castrated, he was, he could not be a Jew. Part of being a Jew is being circumcised. The eunuch, you can put two and two together, could not do that. And when he asks Philip, what prevents me? There is some hurt right there where he says, will this stop me? Is this as far as I can go? Can I only hear the good news but not respond to it? He's expecting because of his situation as a eunuch that the gospel cannot be for him. While Deuteronomy 23.1 shows that a eunuch is to be set apart from the assembly, you can jot this down. It's also in Isaiah. It's also in the chapters after 53. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3 through 5, Isaiah 56, just write it down for later. There's a prophecy that even eunuchs will be in the new covenant, in the new Testament. Stay with me. We must be ready to receive all, no matter what it entails. Did the eunuch have to repent? Yes. Does a sinner have to repent? Yes. But let me tell you something that is going to be hard maybe for us to hear, but it is an understanding of the gospel. Homosexual people can be saved. Transgender people can be saved. Atheists can be saved. People who think and look and act very, very differently from us can be saved. Abortionists can be saved. You name it, can be saved. There is nothing that sets us too far away that we cannot be saved. The gospel invites all of us to receive this gift of salvation. We have to be ready to receive all. The response is for all. But look at how the response plays out. Verse 37. He doesn't just baptize him. Here's how the response is set out. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the qualifying statement. It goes back to Romans. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Romans tells us that this is the way that we might be saved. This is the response that is necessary to believe and accept. But look at what Philip does. He doesn't just say, well, there's some things we got to talk about before you can get baptized. He shows him exactly what that is. Y'all, I, I want you to bring them to me. I do. They, part of it is they need to talk to the pastor about being saved. But there's some things you can do. Philip was not an apostle. Yes, he was a deacon, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he was just any other person in the church. He can say to them, You may be baptized if you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you believe with all your heart and trust in him, you can lead somebody to Christ. But you got to give them the invitation. You got to give them the invitation to respond. Until you give them that, how will they know to respond if you don't give them the invitation? And then the response follows out in verse 38. He ordered the chariot to stop. He sees the water. They both went down into the water. And look how it says it again, Philip and the eunuch. It hones in on this reality that nothing prevents him from being baptized. Philip is in the water with him. He's going to get baptized. And he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. We have to also respond in next steps sometimes. Sometimes we get the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. Sometimes we get the opportunity to say, where's your church home? Let me invite you to come down to First Baptist Brooklyn. Let me invite you to come to Sunday school with me. Let me invite you to come alongside me in this Christian journey. Maybe sometimes we hear, 
that you, you've accepted Jesus, but you haven't been in church anywhere in a long time. You haven't responded in baptism. You haven't responded in whatever the next step might be. We have to give that invitation as part of that evangelistic outreach. And finally, we obey because the call repeats itself, both for Philip, but also for the eunuch. In verse 39, we see the eunuch goes away rejoicing, much like many of the other characters in the gospel who have an encounter with Jesus and they go back and tell everybody. Philip was brought here because now the gospel has gone to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and now to Ethiopia, the ends of the earth. Here's a sneak peek in just one individual where the gospel goes to the end of the earth. But Philip also repeats the call. Philip found himself at Azotus. We don't know how in the world, what happened here with the Spirit snatching him away. It's a mystery we won't understand on this side of eternity. But what we see in the narrative is Philip keeps on going. And Philip finds himself preaching in this place called Azotus. And as he passes through, he kept preaching the gospel to all these cities until he gets there. An invitation that we all need to respond to is the invitation to take part in the spread of the gospel. And if it's just one person, if it's a whole village of people, if it's a family member, whoever it is, we all have an opportunity to respond to that message. And tonight I wonder who is the person that God's laid on your heart? Or what's the thing that you have to do in order to obey that call? Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time and your word. And Lord, we ask that you would lay on our heart a calling to be obedient to you. Lord, we thank you for your great grace in saving us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to lead others to a response in you. Lord, I thank you for your word and for the great truth that the gospel is for everyone. Lord, help us to love even those who are the most different from us, that we might share the good news of Jesus, that they might take part in repentance and be saved. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we go out and be with us as we come back together again on this Friday as we celebrate what you've done in your crucifixion and on this Sunday as we see that you are not dead, but you are surely alive and you are our resurrected Savior. It's in that name, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen.